From teenage fiddle champion to classical violin superstar, Mark O'Connor has had a Grammy-winning career, which has taken him all the way from Nashville to the world stage. As if performing, composing, and recording don't keep him busy enough, he's also sharing his enthusiasm for music and teaching his unique method of string playing. Recently, I had a chance to sit down with him and learn all about it. Mark O'Connor, it's great to see you again. Welcome. Great to be here. Thank you. I would love to talk to you about your development as a musician. Is it true you started off as a guitarist? Guitar was my first instrument, and I learned classically. And um, I wanted to do the whole thing. I wanted to learn flamenco music and c country music and bluegrass, all on the guitar. It wasn't until I was 11 that I actually picked up the violin for the first time. Really? And what happened when you picked it up for the first time? It was amazing. Uh, I'd wanted it for about three years. I saw the violin being played on PBS television, and that really inspired me. But I uh, came from a very poor household, and, um, and my folks could not afford an instrument or, um, or lessons. They thought I should just probably stick with a guitar. That's all they could do. So I tried to make one out of cardboard when I was 10 years old. And, and how did that work out <laughs> for you? I put guitar strings on it and uh, started to fold up. And, um, and I started crying. And I wanted one so bad. And uh, so when they finally broke down and got me one at 11, I practiced and I loved it so much. I probably took it to bed with me and I worked as hard as anyone on it. I practiced, I worked on my creativity. Um, I was a proficient improviser by the time I was 14 years old. I actually won the, the Grand Masters Fiddling Championships at 13. Let's talk about that incredible breakthrough moment you had when you composed Appalachian Waltz, which Yo-Yo Ma ultimately recorded. Where did that come from? When it was time to uh, compose my second violin concerto, um, I was uh, doing some research on Native American history, and I was in New Mexico at the time, and I was sitting in my writing cabin that I had rented and I was sitting there, and as if the, the window opened and a breeze came through the room, I composed Appalachian Waltz in about 20 minutes. And I didn't know what to do with it. A couple of years later, Yo-Yo Ma requested to come down to Nashville, where I was living at the time, and he came to my house. And he had already collaborated with Bobby McFerrin, so you knew he was serious if he was coming to you and talking about doing something out of the box. Yes. Little did we know how much uh, success this project would have. What kind of doors did the success of Appalachia Waltz open for you? Well, I was telling um, Yo-Yo, I remember at some point, is that, you know, this may in fact, you know, have been a, yet another kind of crossover project for Yo-Yo. But for me, it was everything. Like, it, it was my style, the musical concepts that I had been working on for years, bringing in our American folk fiddling into the classical music setting. And that was what I was, you know, kind of resting my hat on. What is your priority these days? Right now is to get uh, my method, the O'Connor method, complete. I started rolling it out a couple of years ago, and it will take me a few more years to finish. The solo method, books for strings, and, and orchestral as well. 
I am a veteran Suzuki parent, and, and that is a method that essentially teaches kids some technique, but is, but is also training their ear. How different is your method from the Suzuki method? Well, there's, there's two classifications of ear training. There's the ear training that um, is popularly known, for instance, in Suzuki and other uh, methodologies, and that's more to do with uh, memorization. 923 um. variations of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And and then ear training to a creative musician involves other things, being able to identify a chord or an interval, um, and being able to adapt to different rhythm and so forth. That kind of ear training is absent of most string uh, playing, and so that's something that I'm bring fully into my method because American music features all of those things. What are the actual mechanics of the method? Using music to to learn how to play by is the principal uh, component of the method. Um, using American music to further that goal is, is the idea. Um, learning how to be creative, improvise, along with playing these beautiful melodies, um, is, is going to be a big part of the acquisition. And I started my own string camps in the summer 20 years ago. And really that was the, the testing ground for some of these new ideas and concepts I had. Uh, there's an O'Connor Method camp in Charleston, South Carolina. That's up and running, which is wonderful. And then uh, Berklee College of Music in Boston is putting on another camp of mine. And, uh, and that also features the method track and uh, we hope that there will be other uh, camps all around the country springing up. The common repertoire um, is really really a healthy thing. Um, it allows children to see um, other kids play the same pieces they've been working on all year and so those camps are very special. So American music is indeed the core of your method because I was thinking in the how you and I started. I don't know this about you, but I assume you had to learn how to play Bach and Beethoven in your early days of playing the fiddle. My mother was a very eclectic uh, follower of, of the arts. And so, yes, at the same time I was learning classical music, I was also learning world music, folk music, American music. I was singing Johnny Cash songs by the time I was eight and nine years old. And I started learning jazz as a young teenager. So by the time I got out of high school, I had this incredible breadth and scope of American music. And that is something that I think has been missing in string education. In strings, we've been mostly in Mozart for the last couple centuries. And I think American music is so strong and powerful, especially these days. Um, you know, it is the language of the world. Where does your latest album, American Classics, fit into this long, wonderful journey you've taken? Well, one of the things that I wanted to um, push forward is that our American folk music is really good. I mean, it, you could arguably say it's the best in the world. It inspired the world, um, right from Stephen Foster and all our stuff. And uh, you know, when, when we can put, you know, when the saints go marching in and, and uh, Oh Susanna and songs like that in a beginning method book for string playing, it's very, very natural. One of the, the big assets about it is that the, the melodies and rhythms are not only catchy, so kids like it right off the bat, but it's easy to be creative with. We don't really know the original notes. And that's what's so kind of magic about this whole American music journey is that each generation adds their own interpretation. And so that's something that, that I wanted my method to really capitalize on is that this music is not just Stephen Foster's, or, and many, many of the pieces, we don't even know who wrote them. But this music is yours. You own it. And you can play it how you want to play it, ultimately. How do we get American children more engaged with music? My hope is that there will be uh, people stepping up to do after-school programs. That's my hope. We have after-school sports. We can have after-school music. We have the venues right there. The music room is empty at three o'clock. Uh, potentially that could be full of people playing music. I'm hopeful and I, I want to be a part of it. And we look 
forward to hearing you for many years to come, either hearing you play or hearing what you've written for the rest of us to play. Thank what a you. pleasure to talk with you. Thanks, Thank you Mark. so much.